So when I assess somebody for shoulder pain, uh, the first thing is, is the history. So some of that is the age of the patient. Did they have an injury or trauma? What are the symptoms that they're describing? Because the location that their pain is in and the age of the patient and the activities that they do can then start to lead to a, a thought process of, okay, I'm gonna focus on these things. Then it comes to the x-ray. So you get a plain x-ray that tells you a lot. Do they have arthritis? Do they have some congenital problem or some bone lesion? And you have to look at those things. You can't see soft tissues on an x-ray, so I can't tell you if there's a, a problem with the ligaments or the labrum or the bicep or the rotator cuff, but you can, you can rule out certain things by getting an x-ray and getting some of that initial history. From an exam standpoint, you have to look at the patient. You have to look at their muscles. Look at both shoulders, okay? Is one shrunken or smaller than the other side? As they move it, is it a fluid motion? Do they move symmetrically or is it off one way or the other? Um, what is their range of motion like? Do they have normal range of motion or is it less? And if they have restricted range of motion, is it because it's weak or because it's stiff? And so you, so you have to assess those different things, okay? If somebody has a stiff shoulder and I can't move it much more than they can, then then that's due to one of three reasons. Either one, there's a dislocation and the ball's not in the socket. Two, there's some bone deformity and it's not round and smooth like arthritis or some congenital problem. Or the third would be is, is if the, the, the bone anatomy looks normal and the cartilage surfaces are smooth but the, the ligaments are tight. And if those ligaments are tight, that's what a frozen shoulder is. A frozen shoulder is very common. It's uh, about 2% of the population will develop a frozen shoulder at some point in their life. More common between the ages of 40 and 60. Women are slightly more common than men, but men get it too. And and then certain populations have a higher risk for it. So diabetes, triglyceride problems, thyroid problems can all increase your risk of it. The good news is about 90% or more of those patients will recover with non-surgical methods. The downside is it can take 18 to 24 months sometimes for that to happen. So we have to do things to try to get them over it. Medications with anti-inflammatories, although sometimes they don't work, and then largely cortisone injections. They seem to be the most effective way to reduce the pain and the inflammation and then allow you to stretch it out. So if you can get the pain less, then it allows you to stretch it out like a piece of taffy over time. Other things are bicep tendon, okay? The bicep, just like it sounds, bicep has two heads. It's two attachments. There's a short head and a long head. The short head is where you get a majority of your strength from. So you, when you go to lift something heavy, that's the short head. The long head is a thin tendon that travels through the front of the shoulder and it enters into the shoulder joint and it attaches to the top rim of the socket. Okay, so the bicep, the long head of the bicep is anchored to the top rim of the socket. And as the ball moves and rotates, then the bicep slides through a groove, kind of like a rope through a pulley system. So if there's a problem where that bicep isn't settled, settled in the groove correctly, then it could actually lead to wearing and, and it could lead to pain. Okay, so bicep tendonitis is a very common cause of pain in the shoulder. Typically patients will have pain right through the front part of the shoulder, can come all the way down into the muscle belly, they can get cramping of it, or sometimes they have, have more generalized shoulder joint related pain where it's deep, or they have pain right where the deltoid muscle inserts onto the side of your arm and it feels like a muscle ache, okay? So that's, that's gonna be more of your bicep tendonitis. Now that can be something that's young overhead throwing athlete type of pain, or it can be in people who are older and it just wears out over time just from overuse or, or overdoing it in the yard or some other activity. Traumatically they can they can occur though. So the bicep attaches to the labrum. The labrum is that ring of tissue that surrounds and attaches to the rim of the socket. It's like a golf ball uh, uh, that sits on a golf tee and you take a golf tee with that ring, a ring of rubber around it. If you look at that on a clock face, the bicep attaches to the 12 o'clock position. So if you get a repetitive pulling or tugging of the bicep, then sometimes that, that labrum or that tissue can peel away from the rim. And when that occurs, it leads to a loosening or a pulling of that bicep, and that's what can lead to the tendon tendonitis of the bicep, but also lead to deep-seated pain in the back of the shoulder. So when you wind up to throw or you reach up high to, to get something, then that can occur. So they can occur either in a repetitive action thing or they can occur from a trauma. If your arm gets jammed or yanked out away from you, then the similar thing can happen and lead to those pain. And there's a wide range of symptoms that people can get. They get pain, they get a sense of instability sometimes, they get a, a dead arm, it feels numb. There's a lot of different 
symptoms that people can get that it's hard for them to explain. The vast majority of those patients are treated conservatively. About 70 to 80 percent of the time you can manage it by reducing the pain with a pill or even an injection if necessary, and then it's physical therapy. You have to, to reduce the pain and restore the shoulder mechanics. When you raise your arm, the, the arm bone, the humerus, the collarbone, and the shoulder blade all have to move in a certain synchronous motion. And if anything's out of whack, then there's a link out of the chain. So you have to reset that. So you gotta reestablish the shoulder blades so they're moving normally. You gotta reestablish the rotator cuff strength and that helps to improve the stability and improve your function to where even if somebody had a tear of the labrum, of, of the top labrum, uh, you can still manage it and live with it without ever having a surgery on it.